Hey guys, can you hear me? Howdy. Just a few housekeeping announcements. If you could please, um, photography is allowed. Just no flash. Please turn off your flash on your cameras. Um, cell phones, if you have cell phones, please put them on silent or vibrate. Calls can be taken out in the hallway. And the last thing is there is a uh, microphone in the center of the room. Please use that if you have any questions. Um, the, uh, there, this is broad, broadcast live, so if you're asking questions from your chair, they can't hear you. So please go to the center of the room, to the microphone, for the questions. Other than that, we should be good to go. Enjoy. All right. Yeah, we got a couple minutes. Are y'all having a good con? That's great. Last time I asked this room that question, they were just like, ooh. But you guys were on point, so. Uh, this, this group is way better than the last group. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, we're going to chill for like a minute and a half and let people uh, continue to trickle in, and then we're going to get started talking about some comic books. Uh, in the meantime, this is where you can find everybody on the panel. Uh, Josh Williamson here does not have a table, but if you see him in the con floor, just grab him and shake him as hard as you can. Uh, but everyone else, they ha hanging at their table, they're selling books. Uh, some are sketching, some will talk to you for about whatever you want to talk about. And have a good weekend. Good hey. All right, uh, so this is the Image Comics genre panel. Uh, we're talking about the different types of stories that we publish at Image, or rather the creators of those stories <laughs> are talking about what they, uh, what they have created and why why they work in the genre they've chosen to work in. Uh, I want, I'm going to go down the line and just introduce the book and creator, let them talk a little bit about what the book is, and then we're going to get into some audience Q&A, so start thinking about questions. And I have a few questions for everyone on the panel, so it'll be pretty smooth and we'll have a good time. Sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Uh, first up is Kelly Sue DeConnick, writer oh, of Pretty, Pretty Deadly, uh, which is drawn by Emma Rios, colored by Jordi Belair, lettered by Clayton Cowles. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about this comic? Uh, it's a weird little book. Uh, uh, the, uh, the first two issues, um, you will probably be completely lost. It's okay. Um, uh, we, tip our, we start to tip our hands on the third issue, um, on the fourth a little more, and on the fifth, I kind of feel like all the cards are on the table, but the fifth issue comes out this Wednesday, and I will find out whether I'm right or wrong about that soon thereafter. <laughs> um, it is, uh, when you see the art, it, it's insanely beautiful. Um, so uh, this is not, unfortunately, a book that we can produce 24 pages in 30 days. So, um, so we got ahead before we solicited. And of course, by the fifth issue, we're running a little bit behind again. Um, so we're going to be taking a break, putting out the trade, getting ahead again. And we'll repeat that process for the second arc um, and then uh, uh, if things continue to go as well as they have gone thus far, and which I, I, I have to tell you, Emma and I literally thought like six people will buy this book. Um, like we really did not think that we would get the reception that we got uh, on it. And uh, uh, six on the first issue became 60,000, um, which was a huge, uh, literally, literally three times uh, my dream number for the book. Uh, so uh, uh, because of that, we're going to be able to continue into a second arc. Um, and if things continue to go as they have gone, our, our, our ideal is that we're going to get uh, four arcs out of it um, so we can get the whole story out for you. And uh, so we'll have a trade um, uh, after each arc and then... Um, some uh, some some nice hardcovers planned with some bonus materials uh, in it, in them as well. And we're doing the 9.99 trade on this. Uh, if there are any retailers in the house, um, so. Uh, next up are Jason's Aaron and Latour, creators of Southern Bastards. Woo! Uh, so let's talk about that title. Why Southern Bastards? It's pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah, it's autobiographical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, they say write what you know, right? Like that's what I know. We we both grew up in the South. Uh, we both know lots of bastards who live in the South. Uh, so I, uh, I mean, for me, I think this is the story of what I love and hate about the place where I was born. 
um, you know, a place I, I still consider myself a Southerner, even though I don't live there anymore. Um, I, I think of myself as a Southern writer. Um, and yeah, there, there's a, a, a lot I love about the place. A, uh, 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 it's a very beautiful place, but it's also at the same time a very scarred and ugly place. So this is about all that kind of rolled into one um, in the form of a story about a man with a really big stick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next up, we've got Shudder which is uh, written by Joe Keating over there, drawn by Leila Del Duca here. Thank you. When does this one come out? Uh, April 9th. April 9th. So, like, so we're almost there. Two weeks. To two weeks, it's, and it's been crazy, because Leila and I met at a New York Comic Con uh, 2012, and immediately after that, we're, like, we're talking about working together, and then this idea came along, and uh, well, yeah, it's been this huge process since then, and now it's like a thing. It's like I've seen copies now. <laughs> There's this weird these, these, you know, phone calls and emails and everything have like manifested into this like 20-page thing. It's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's cool. that, that shutter. We've got a couple of samples of Layla's art here. Uh, I think I, I, th I think uh, I think kids got a future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Check out that perspective. Like it looks really good. <laughs> Frank. This is your five ghosts. I've got a couple covers up and I've got some pages to show off. Oh, that's an exciting page. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, and we'll leave it at that. Yeah. No. <laughs> we actually just uh, celebrated our first year of five ghosts. We're really excited about that. We, de we debuted the book at Emerald City last year, so it's been a very crazy year. It's the first major work I've published along with artist Chris Mooneyham and our colorist Lauren Affey. We're so happy to be at Image. We're so happy many of you are still reading the book. Uh, we have our second collection coming out in June. Uh, it's going to have seven issues in it. We can't do math, so <laughs> when everyone's like, do five, then trade. We missed that boat, but it's going to be a nice, thick collection. It's going to be about 200 pages. It's $14.99. Our uh, first collection's out now, and the book, we build it as a literary pulp adventure, and I think we've stuck to that pretty well. We have a treasure hunter who's very much an Indiana Jones type character, possessed by the ghosts of five literary characters, who are Merlin, Shake, uh, Shake, sorry, no, Merlin, Robin Hood, Sherlock Holmes, Musashi Miyamoto, and Dracula, and he can channel their powers. So, if you're interested in checking it out, we have the first trade. It's 9.99, and our second one will be out soon. I have all the issues at my table, and Lauren Affy, the colorist, is with us, and that's one of my favorite pages with the giant crab that just came out, so. Is, is, uh, is Mooneyham here? Chris is not. Chris is at home oh, working. Well, it's a bummer. Yeah, his art style is, it's like a European adventure comic. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. And he's yeah. just like, as a dude, he is hilarious. Oh. <laughs> we, we got to celebrate the launch of Pretty Deadly with Kelly, Sue, and Emma, and it was... That was, a my, that was a good time. That, that was, was a lot of fun. That was a good time. I got to yeah. drive you guys around, and yeah. you didn't question anything when you entered my car. You're just like, well, <laughs> yeah. he's going to drive, and I'm going to accept that. So Yeah, you. I live with Matt Fraction. I just like, yeah, whatever. I, I figure it's going to be what it's going to be. No, but we're happy to be here, and again, thank you, everyone who's reading the book. We will keep doing it as long as we humanly can. So, Cool. Uh, last but not least is Josh Williamson, writer of Ghosted. Uh, how... <laughs> How would you explain Ghosted to uh, an audience full of strangers? Uh, Ghosted, oh, it's uh, Ocean's Eleven in a haunted house instead of a casino. Um, it opens up with uh, Jackson Winters as this man uh, who's kind of on this, uh, he basically is waiting for death at this point in prison, and he gets broken out of prison and by this rich old collector who believes there's just one thing missing from his collection, and that is a real ghost. And so he hires Jackson to break into this uh, famous haunted house to try to steal a ghost from it. Um, the second arc, uh, Jackson survived the haunted house mission and now has a new mission of this cult called the uh, Cult of the Closed Book. They kidnapped possessed people, um, and Jackson is assigned with trying to find uh, one of the possessed people and bring them back. And we're in the middle of that arc right now. Um, one of my favorite characters um, was a character named Anderson who died in the first issue or the fifth issue. And I like her so much that I brought her back as a ghost because I thought it actually made sense. <laughs> so that's her on the left up there. Um, and Four more and you'll get there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, well, anyway, nice yeah. Nice <laughs> totally screwed me up. I'll, I'll um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, you like totally threw my question. <laughs> and right before so, this panel, Latour actually punched him in the throat. Yeah. Which is why this has been my entire day. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so what we're doing with uh, Anderson, we brought her back, and her whole thing is that she hates Jackson, and she blames him for her death, 
And so she will not, she keeps protecting Jackson because she wants to make sure when Jackson finally does die that it's glorious, that it's a, a horrible, brutal, like the worst death a person can have. And until she thinks that that's how he's gonna die, she will continue to save him. So every time you think that he, he thinks he's about to die, she's like, nope, I'm gonna save you because that's not a good enough death for you. I don't feel like it's more bad enough. Um, so that's where we're at right now in the book. And then issue, Mateo Scalera is doing the covers for uh, six through 10, and now Dan Panosian's coming on to do covers with issue 11. And that's, oh, that's wow. news, right? Like, no one yeah, knows that we just, yet. Yeah, we were just, because I just that's, saw a cover. That's a nice. <laughs> you yeah. got to see the cover. It's awesome. Oh. Um, but he's taking over to do covers, and Gorin, who did the first five issues, is coming back to do uh, issue 11. Uh, this is Gorin's art here from yeah. fifth issue, I think? Yeah, it's from the fifth issue. That's, yeah, that's when they were all in the haunted house and the shit was going down and the ghosts were coming after him. Yeah, it kind of starts with things going wrong and then just getting wronger and wronger. Yeah, that's what we talk about with Jackson. Like, uh, there's a scene in issue 10, and I think you and I were talking about the other day, that uh, there's a moment where Jackson actually smiles uh, in the middle of issue 10, and then after that, it just gets worse and worse for him. <laughs> like, it just, the moment you turn that page, it just gets horrible for him for a few issues. Uh, no, I got one more thing to show. Do you guys want to see something gross? <laughs> All right. Oh, Nailbiter. Yeah. What is Nailbiter? Uh, Nailbiter, we announced the Image Expo. Uh, Nailbiter, I always tell this story. Uh, what happened was when I was an art director, uh, Joe's over there like, I hate this cover so much. <laughs> no, um, it works. It yeah, does it the works. job very yeah. well. Um, uh, many years ago, I was an art director. Uh, this woman that I worked with, she came into work one day, and she was telling me about how she had broke up with her boyfriend. And I remember thinking they were like a happy couple, so I was very curious what happened. And she said, oh, I found out that his uncle was a serial killer. And you know, he'd like murdered five women. And I was like, well, you know, you start talking about him. I'm like, well, did, did, did he know? Was he involved somehow? She's like, no, but I just can't be in a relationship with somebody who is so close to something so evil. And it always stuck with me, this idea we talk a lot about the victims, but we never talk about the families of the killers and how they're also the victims. I mean, what would you do if you found out someone you knew was a serial killer? You know, you would have to start questioning, did I know somehow? Was, did I somehow influence her? Could I have stopped it? Uh, like with Jeffrey Dahmer, his parents, they always go back and forth on who blames who. Uh, like his friends from high school, they sometimes think about, we saw the signs, you know? And that's always stuck with me. So I created this book called Nailbiter, um, which features that guy right there is Charles Edward Warren, who is, uh, he kidnaps people who chew their nails and then he, he uh, chews their nails for them and then he kills them. Um, and the book takes place in a town called Buckaroo. So it's family entertainment. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so the book takes place in a town called Buckaroo, Oregon, where 16 of the worst serial killers uh, were all born and raised. And this FBI agent wants to go there. He caught, he caught Warren, the nail biter, and then started realizing, yeah, over the last 40 years, these 16 horrible serial killers all happened to grow up in the same town. Uh, and he wants to know why. And he goes there, and then he gets there, and something really bad happens to him in issue one. So it's being drawn by uh, Mike Henderson, who was the artist that I worked on with Masks and Mobsters. All right, so that's everything, well, not everything everyone up here is working on, but it's uh, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, if you have questions, you can start lining up at the mic, and we'll just go back and forth. Uh, but start thinking. I really want to do a Q&A. It's really good to hear from you guys. Yeah. But uh, I want to like segue from kind of this grossness to. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. You know. No, it, I, in a, a perfectly positive way uh, towards Southern bastards. <laughs> Spiritual uh, sequel to Dear Dracula, right, Chuck? Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh my God, man! I have a funny story about that cover. I can tell another time. Uh, Aaron or Latour, uh, what kind of how dark is this story going to get? Do you want to answer it? Um, I don't know how dark does crime get I mean pretty dark yeah uh, I don't know that there's yeah, really a limit yeah. to that um, I don't know I don't want to put words in Jason's mouth but um, go ahead <laughs> <laughs> I think I don't know if you're familiar with his work on scalps there's there's always an underlying sense of humor Woo! there we go Thank you. Um, scalp was a really dark book um, <laughs> obviously um, and while it was funny at times, like I think, um, was, was it? <laughs> There's something wrong with you if you were laughing at that. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I'm that's appealing to this uh, about the subject matter to me, other than like the personal relationship, is uh, 
in growing up and having and coping with like some of the things that have made me angry and conflicted about like the South, like one of the things that I find interesting about it is that oftentimes the people that I find the scariest are also the funniest. So I think um, there's a certain absurdity to uh, to a lot of the of violence inherently, but also when you filter it through like broken people, you know, there's a, there's something funny about that, and I think that will balance like however dark it it may get. Yeah, yeah, it is. That? It's definitely funnier than scalped. <laughs> you can use that as a pull quote. Yeah. <laughs> funnier than scalped. Funny. Um, yeah, I think you know we talk about it's more Coen Brothersy. Yeah. Like we want it to be more uh, like our favorite Coen Brothers movie. So yeah, there's a lot of dark humor. Um, uh, like the first, the first uh, fight scene, the first action scene, and the first issue takes place in the kitchen of a barbecue, uh, barbecue joint. Um, so yeah, it's dark and it's gritty and it's mean and it's ugly, but there are also people for you to laugh at, I guess. Or, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, you got a question? Yeah, um, this is gonna be a super silly question, but Joshua, does the nail biter also look for people who bite their toenails? No, he doesn't. No, so it's not, just hand nails. Like second arc, second arc. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things when we were working on the book, like Mike and I sat down and we were like, we were trying to come up with the MOs for 16 serial killers and we wanted them to be all unique. Like eight deep, we're like, oh man, we were screwed. Like we can't come up with 16. Um, but uh, we have a couple spots left open. I'm totally gonna put You should call there. Chris Sabella. <laughs> we have, we've had some talks about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, well, we we got the map that we're gonna do, but no, it's only the only the fingers. I'm a lifelong nail biter, so that's where that started for me. Autobiographical. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say, <laughs> sort of. Yeah. And this I immediately strange. wondered if he like looks at women who have like uh, acrylics on or something, like wondering if maybe there's bitten nails underneath those. Oh man, there's a an issue <laughs> issue three. I'm kind of ruining this, I guess, but issue three. Uh, <laughs> There's a, a young woman in town who's very curious about serial killers, and she's talking to him, and he's like, you think you're the first person to come and ask these questions? And she's like, well, yeah, I can give you something. And she, he says, what? And she just shows him <laughs> her hand, and that's where we cut away from that. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to reading that. Oh, thank you. Go for it. So this question is also for Josh. Um, mm -hmm. What was the research process like when trying to come up with all of the different serial killers? Really depressing. <laughs> like, dude, I, uh, I read a lot of stuff about serial killers, and it really bummed me out. But at the same time, uh, it did. It was like, really? yeah, man. And I would read, you know, there, I have an encyclopedia. It's like A through Z of like pretty much all the serial killers. And not just serial killers, but like genocide stuff, too. And it was like, fuck, it was did horrible. You, did you ever watch that, um, oh, God, that, that, that A&E show where they, the, where they like assigned a, a numerical Miracle system to evil. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. you remember what was the name I've of that show? I watched a lot. I can't remember this. Uh, it was, it was like, so how evil are you? Yeah. Well, this guy's a ten, it's, it's and on, here's why. It's on, uh, it's but on seriously, like, uh, uh, no, Buzz, no, it was, was Buzzfeed. Was... <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Uh, but you know, it helped us out a lot, though. Like Mike and I were able to come up with our own personal code because we both there were certain things we didn't want to do. You know, we just made decisions of like, because it's really uh, actual serial killer stuff is very ugly and it's actually much more min mundane. You know, it's not Batman's Rogue Gallery. It's much more sad and just ugly. And so we really sat down and we're like, there were certain things we were not going to touch, even though that was like, you know, ninety nine percent of serial killers is always about the same two things, and we were going to avoid those because we just didn't want to touch it so that was one thing once we figured that out then figuring out the rest was a little bit better but it was definitely for a long time like mike and i the artists were talking we were just like getting sad about stuff you know because it really is kind of horrible what's out there really yeah, i know right <laughs> well it's, it's weird when you start reading this stuff and, and one thing that scared me was i thought that the idea of 16 shield killers being from the same town seemed impossible and then to find out that it actually was not impossible it's happened twice there's two different cities that have had like a lot of Is one of them killers. Chicago? No. <laughs> one was in South Africa and the one was somewhere in Eastern Europe. And I remember the one in Eastern Europe was really funny because the, they were interviewing the cop about why, you know, why were so many serial killers operating in a city? And he said, he's like, well, every city has this many serial killers. We're just the best at catching them. <laughs> <laughs> An optimist. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But no problem. That's sort of like like Dexter. Like Dexter takes place mm -hmm. in, in in a Miami where they're like nineteen serial killers yeah. or whatever. And I was like, dude, I would move. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'd just be like, oh, yeah. no, I'm moving. 
<laughs> well, I, I grew up in Riverside, California, which is a horrible place. And also full of serial uh, killers. Also full of serial killers. I found out this is kind of the start. Actually, I found out that the Zodiac was living. The, the, they believed at one point the Zodiac lived in Riverside in the '80s. And I remember thinking, like, I knew there were two. There was like two different serial killers also operating from Riverside in the '80s. And I was like, that's so crazy. I think in my little town, that the same yeah. time there were three serial killers there. Uh, this is a side conversation, but uh, yeah. but so like after, ask me about uh, the block we lived on in Casey. You know, who we should talk to is Casey right here. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, All right. We, after this, we'll talk to her. Right. I don't want to say out loud. <laughs> yeah. There's a. Can I say what it is? I don't want to embarrass you. So the serial killer that the. Can I say this, this is cool? The serial killer that uh, the girl I worked with, um, Casey, lived next door to him. Jeez. And we didn't find this out until we were at Image Expo, and I announced it, and she was like, I think I know what he's talking about. Wow. And so after we started talking, it was the same serial killer. Oh, man. Yeah. So she knew. She knows exactly what I'm talking about, that idea. And you, you even said, like, you were, like, that guy is weird and horrible. <laughs> and then you hear this, and you're like, it all makes sense. You know, it was a horrible thing. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, actually, I want to stay on research for a second. Uh, Frank and Kelly Sue, both of you are doing period pieces. How much research are you doing into getting the tone or the feel right? Or are you just winging it and going for whatever yeah, works none, best? Yeah, none. None at all. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and and uh, you laugh, but I, I mean that absolutely and completely sincerely. And in fact, I got in a fight with my editor early on um, because uh, she was like, well, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm making fun of her. She's phenomenal. I love her to death. Um, uh, I chose her, but uh, but she was, uh, I don't know, being editorial. And, uh, and she was like, well, you know, you, you need to tell me. I almost did like a voice. You need to tell me what year this is set in. And, uh, uh, and I was like, no. Uh, and she was like, no, because we need to. And I was like, it is not a history. There is a talking bunny, OK? It is not a history. This is. Um, this is the myth of lemon. This isn't an actual lemon. This is, uh, there, there, there is nothing, I, I don't want people coming up to me and telling me that like, well, the real gunslingers wouldn't have been, like, I don't care. Um, uh, it's, this is not about, like, you know what also didn't happen? A dude with a giant skull for a head, all right? Um, so yeah, it, it is. Uh, 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 I have only done the research that is um, rewatching beloved Western films, which are also <laughs> highly inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the same boat, and we really kind of just screwed ourselves by having pirates and Nazis appear in the same timeline. And that was like, <laughs> but you clearly the 1800s pirates. And we say we're in amorphous 30s. We never put a you know, like they think They're okay with the ghosts and yeah, the powers. Yeah, like, there's but, a like, dude riding a dragon. Like, let's, let's giant crab. That's let's, let's, yeah. case in point. But, uh, yes, but no, we giant crab, your argument is invalid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, we really just try to capture a lot of the aesthetic, a lot of the spirit. And we have uh, literary characters, but our literary characters are archetypal. They're not the actual characters, because I didn't want, on top of that, people being like, well, Sherlock Holmes would never do that, asshole. Like, <laughs> I get it, I get it. But uh, again, we just really took everything we love and put together. And in the same way, we didn't want to put a date on it, because we, it's not a history. It's the same way. We want to catch the spirit of the things we love. And yeah, we're going to do crazy stuff. Like, there are Nazis, there are pirates. Maybe robots. There's not robots. But, uh, <laughs> now you have to. There's not robots for the next yet. year. Right. <laughs> I know. Not robots well, yet. if the book goes on until like 2090, we'll have to. Hellboy had Nazi robots. Like you could totally get away with it. Like there's precedent now. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that Hellboy has also become like a genre. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got a question. Hi. Um, this is a question for Kelly Sue. Um, you talk so much when you're talking about Captain Marvel and superhero stories about how much inspiration you take from mythology, from opera, from these very big, grand, over-the-top stories. And when I read Pretty Deadly, like, it feels like a myth to me. It feels like reading the Oresteia or... I love you. There's something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like very specific, like, very powerful myths. And I'm wondering if when coming up with Pretty Deadly, you're taking sort of the same sort of inspiration or if it's something slightly different, well, two halves of the same coin or... We started out with Pretty Deadly wanting to do a very straightforward Sergio Leone homage. That was the plan. Um, and then the talking bunny. Uh, and uh, the talking bunny made of bones. Um, and I don't 
I can't tell you where that came from. I literally have no idea where that came from. Uh, the, but the bunny and the butterfly just sort of walked onto panel and started talking. And then, uh, and I know, I do know how crazy that, that sounds and how pretentious. And I, and I apologize, um, but it's a fact. Um, so uh, uh, this, this sort of came into my head and I couldn't make it go away. And then I tried to force the story to go more straightforward and it just died. It was just dead on the page. And then so when we sort of finally decided, and you know, Emma is, Emma's so great. Um, uh, you know, Emma's like, you know, let the magic happen, you know? And, uh, uh, and, so, you know, we, we let the monsters come in because, because we had to, because the story just wouldn't go anywhere without them. And then, and then Charlie Houston found for me, because there was a part of me that was like bummed. I was like, but I wanted, I wanted to do my Tony Leone thing. <laughs> and, um, uh, and Charlie Houston found this quote from me where Leone says, uh, uh, the, the, the myth is everything. And, and it kind of, and I got goosebumps because it, I, I ended up feeling like we came around the other side to doing a Leone story anyway, um, without, without my understanding that, that that was what we were doing. Um, and I think that there is very definitely a, um, a, a Grimm's fairy tales kind of influence to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a... Uh, I have always flinched at fantasy. I have always been like that is my nerd line in the sand. Like you know, like I, no, no, you know, um, uh, like spaceships, robots. All right, no elves. Um, but Three joke pants just running. yeah, I know, I know. Uh, but 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 this is like the universe punishing me for that or something. They're like, oh yeah. Um, but uh, so it's it's it became this sort of epic mythological thing. Really, it, it, despite my every effort. Yeah, Although now, I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I like about this panel is uh, it goes bastards, death dealers, ghosts, and then Joe and Layla, you guys almost have like, it's a sci-fi story that stars someone who's kind of tired of all the sci-fi aspects. Yeah. If that makes sense? Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean... I, I would it's, say it's more fantasy than yeah. sci-fi. Yeah. I mean, there's it, 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 kind of the, when I initially came up with this, this, this idea years and years and years ago, it was actually kind of simple. I went through a similar thing where it was like, I wanted to do Tintin or I wanted to record a Maltese. I wanted to do like my world, you know, traveling adventurer and there's not, there's no robots, there's no uh, rocket ships. And I mean, spoilers, there's a rocket ship in it now. <laughs> and <laughs> what that came out of was, was meeting Layla at, at New York and, and seeing her artwork. And I'm just like, holy crap, you can just draw anything. And I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but I asked you for a list of stuff you wanted to draw, and your, your answer was everything, right? <laughs> yeah, except for superheroes and zombies, <laughs> I think. Yeah, so it kind of became like, well, let's screw it. Like, we'll just, we'll just, like, the, the, the core of this book is this, um, this, this is a, a woman named Kate who is the last in the line, this family of uh, world fair adventurers and explorers and, um, Ten years ago, she just she left it. She was like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, something happens with the family secret that gets out that, that kind of draws her back. Um, and that's the core of it is like what her, her her journey is both personally and, and you know and actually. But like, there's all sorts of random crap in here. Like, it's because it's 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 fun to, to see what you do with it. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, it's people would, might think it's sci-fi from the first few pages because it takes place on the moon in a flashback but then it it quickly goes to this really fantastical version of earth where like mythological beings and fantasy creatures have kind of always existed and it's not that big of a deal to anyone because it's always been that way but yeah um so it's like set in this fantastic realm but it's really just about family and who you make into your family uh and then how you deal with your blood relations if you don't like them. Stuff. But then there's like, in the second issue, there's a gang of pinstri like tight lions in pinstripe suits who have a flying car and a giant... And I say tight lions? Sold. <laughs> tight, tight lions? Tight lions. I um, so, I mean, it's kind of whatever. Again, it, it, we all kind of work it in there. That's what I love about comics, that you can do anything. You know, there's no, especially at Image, there's no one being like, oh, well, you can't have a rocket ship in a fantasy book. Because it's like, you know, who cares? Like, it's just like, you know, it, it'll make it look awesome. 
Yeah, Joe, I got to read uh, Shutter Number One. I think around Christmas time, I think. And I just on my iPad sat down and read it, and I was like, "This is easily Joe's best work." Oh, thanks, man. Like, it's a lot of fun. It's good. The characters, like, you know, it, I think there's a couple books. Uh, like, Sex Criminals is a book I love because I feel like I know those people. Like, I've known them in my life. I went to school with them. Like, you know, like you feel it. And I felt the same way with Shutter when I was reading it. Like, I was just like, I know this girl. Hmm. You know, I can hear her voice. I can hear her talking to her friend about what you know they were doing. I like, really was on and. And I got the art was beautiful. Like I was just really like happy with it. And I like told Joe this like uh, I think I think it was via text. I think I was just like I think you were having a hard day or something. Yeah. And I was just like this is a beautiful comic book, man. This is, the, <laughs> this is so good. Yeah. It is. It's really a great comic. Thank you. Well, yeah. This is my favorite thing about Layla's art is we'll have this crazy, absurd, over the top, tight line situation, <laughs> but you're drawn to Kate and her emotion and what she's going through. And I think it's such a hard. Thing, thing, thing to do, you know, like that, that. The little subtle acting, I guess I don't know if that's what you would call it. Um, Thank but you. Yeah, you, you make that work. You, 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 this is this is amazing. So good job. Thank you. Um, I also want to say that Owen Gianni colors oh, it. Oh yeah. Um, and he adds a, just a, he makes it. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Like he's so fucking amazing <laughs> at coloring, and he c colors my work in like three different styles in the first issue, and I think they're all amazing. Um, and it wouldn't, the, the comic wouldn't near, look nearly as awesome without Owen and what he adds to the book. Uh, you got a question? Yeah, this is for the Jasons. Uh, when, when you're creating a story that you know, uh, how do you identify what you need to research? Uh, I, I don't know that I researched anything for this book. <laughs> I, I I researched it for I've spent my whole for life thirty years. Yeah, when I when I lived in in Alabama, uh, and I watched lots of uh, the Dukes of Hazard, and uh, lots of Coen Brothers movies, and read lots of crime, lots of James Elroy books. Um, yeah, I mean, there's this is this is the uh, one book I didn't have to worry about research really. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much of it that's what I grew up around. Not that I grew up around people getting shot constantly, but in terms of the characters that you meet in this book, um, you know, I think it, probably both of us know, know a lot of these people. Yeah, you spend... Or are these people. Yeah, you spend pretty much, you know, 36 years of your life tearing your own head apart, uh, you know, trying to get to understand why you are the way you are. Uh, so it kind of prepares you for something that's like this, you know? It sounds like you had a fun childhood. I did. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I met uh, uh, Latour, there was a project you were working on, and I honestly don't remember what it what it was now. But I remember like we were asking you like, "What's it about?" And there's this like long ass silence. He goes, "I'm gonna drop an awesome bomb on your ass." <laughs> 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 and my, my accent is not as good as his, but uh, that but, was like, incredible. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> But I think even like setting, having the football coach, like the football culture setting feels so, I grew up in Georgia and my high school actually just lost its state. And that, that feels very true. Yeah, I played football in high school of all things. I'm probably the only artist I've ever met that did that. Um, I wasn't very good, but I was on the team. And um, it's a pretty ridiculous culture that I, I love and, um, and also hate. So it's kind of, uh, I've never seen, it's not like a huge, it is a huge element in the book. It's not a thing that's on page a whole lot in the first issue, first series. Yeah, yeah I mean, you certainly don't need to be a football fan yeah. or know shit about football to it's read It's basically, book. one of the, the conceits of the book is that, like, you know, if you hate tough guy comics, you might like this comic. If you love them, you'll like this comic. If you <laughs> hate football, you might love this comic. If you love football, you probably love this comic. I think that's... It's the dichotomy of the thing that uh, that interests me anyway, because I don't know that there's an answer that's more interesting than the question. That's a good note. To I'm like Russ Cole all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> it's like can you, time. Can you cut this a, water bottle yeah. apart and make a little man out of it. Awesome. Uh, Southern bastard is a flat circle. Yeah. 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 It's been a long weekend, man. Uh, <laughs> Go for it. Um, so, I'm from the South myself, and I'm wondering, Jason and Jason, if I, it took me moving away, actually, and living out here for about eight years to kind of appreciate 
some of the more beautiful things about where I'm from. And yeah. I understand what you're both saying about you know what's ugly about it, but if I sound yeah. confused, it's because I am. It's okay. No. <laughs> yeah. uh, me too. And the thing is, I'm just curious if you also saw the beauty about it after leaving, or if you left. Well, I, I moved back. He's not there anymore. <laughs> See, he's, he's pretty weak. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't hack it. Um, no, I think for me, yeah, I, I, I moved out of the South. I moved to Kansas, uh, to the Midwest, like 14 years ago. So I, st I still have family in Alabama. I still go back there a lot, still visit. So I think going back does remind me of the, oh, th these are the things that I really like about this place. But it also it's a stark reminder of, Oh, these are the things I really don't like about this place. Yeah, so. I did a I did a really dumb thing in that <clears throat> when I first decided that I was ready to kind of run away, I went deeper into the south. <laughs> 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 so I like I grew up in North Carolina, so then I grew I, I lived in Atlanta for a while in Florida, and then it took me moving to New York City to um, really miss it. Even though I loved New York, there was part of me that <clears throat> felt like I needed to at least go home and stared in the face for real like as an adult um, and I'm glad that happened um, because now I'm able to to laugh about things a little bit and actually appreciate what I things that as a kid I maybe have looked past you know um, so <clears throat> for me in particular like there's a lot of anger in in the in the book maybe but there's also a lot of love um, next question Hawkeye <laughs> Um, so, uh, from what I'm hearing is uh, Joshua is the only one who's researched anything, and it totally... <laughs> <laughs> and it yeah, he's to a sucker. It totally <laughs> bummed him out. Yeah, like, that's how sad he is. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lesson here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess uh, my question is maybe on other projects, if you've, been, if you've been researching something and had a good experience with it and discovered something that helped, or um, if, I don't know, Frank, if you've been researching anything, because I don't think you've talked about that much. I used to be a high school English teacher, so, and I love literary canon, I love stories, and all of that kind of comes through me, I think, in this, and Five Books comes from a really just fun, organic spot for everyone on the team, and it's really our love letter to everything we love in comics, and that's why we are not worried about fact, it's how we process everything, and I think that's really what research is for. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a book on Dark Horse called The White Suits that deals with a lot of Cold War stuff, and the fun part on research, and I'm sure everybody here knows, and Josh, even with Nailbiter, is when you start doing research and you're writing a story, it weirdly starts creeping in. And, and with that project, we, it's a crime story and it takes place during the Cold War, and we started finding all these weird links that almost felt like we placed them. And that's the cool thing about research. It can be exciting, you can learn a lot, and you can also get caught in a hole. I hear a lot of writers say, like, sometimes if they get very heavy into research, they'll just, again, especially with technology and the internet, they'll just go off and get stuck in research and not do their writing, but uh, it's a yin and yang. You get a lot from it, but you have to be purposeful, I feel like. And, mm -hmm. and, and with things like this, it's just there's so much, and it comes from such a, like, a personal space. It's how we've processed so much. But, but when I have done research, like I said, it, it's about finding the purposeful research. It can, it can really give and take. It can be inspiring. It can be educating. And, I know, I'm sure. Well, Josh, can yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of something that was a positive research experience. <laughs> uh, well, Captain Midnight was fun. I had researched all kinds of old Captain Midnight stuff. That was easy. But with Nailbiter, it was tough because for the research, I didn't want to get too much into it. And then I started realizing at one point while I was working on it that one of the main things I wanted to research, it wasn't just serial killers, different types of serial killers. I was trying to research the, the research that actual doctors have done into what causes serial killers. And I started realizing at one point, I was getting so lost in the research that I was no longer trying to write a comic. I was trying to solve what makes serial killers. <laughs> and like, that's impossible, you know? Like, no one could ever, you know, figure that out. And I, that was a moment where I was like, I had to take a step back because I was getting too much into that, which is like, could never answer in a comic book. Who would watch a TV show about a comics creator trying to solve serial killers? <laughs> I feel like that's an amazing hook. I'm pretty sure that's Castle, just, you know, <laughs> like. Um, my, uh, uh, my next book is called Bitch Planet, so my entire <laughs> life has been research. <laughs> my yeah, next comic is called uh, before Tight Image Lines. Expo. Tight Lines. Yeah. Uh, right before Image Expo, um, yeah. I went to the FTP site to, like, to upload Nailbiter stuff, <laughs> and I saw all the titles. And I saw Bitch Plant, and I was like, who thinks they're going to get away with that? It was all caps, right? I remember. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 
And I remember sitting in the back. I'm in the back and I'm watching the thing and then Kelly goes up there and it's all bitch plan. I was soft. <laughs> <laughs> And the bummer too is like in the the the, the first sketch that Val did of the cover, yeah. like the he did a sketch and it's like it's like this, you know, yeah. like the, the the and then uh and like the finish art comes in and he's angled the hand a little mm -hmm. bit and it it's beautiful, but it's like it's not quite as it was like, no no no, not subtle, not <laughs> subtle. Yeah. Side finger. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah like side boob. Yeah. Just go for it, you know? Yeah. I guess we publish Sex, Sex Criminals, Southern Bastards, Bitch Planet. Like, it's, it's all downhill from here. It's going to get yeah. more and more filthy. My next book, Motherfuckers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Motherfuckers, colon, fuck you. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, can, yeah. Can we do some kind of, like, line-wide crisis on Infinite Earth? Where <laughs> yeah. The bastards and the yeah. bitches and the sex criminals the age all of a together. <laughs> Uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> so the image are there comics. Children in the room. <laughs> God, the image not, comics not shared anymore, sex are. universe. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so, um, question for the writers. Sort of when you're oh, totally forgetting my question after all the. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> it was all the fucks, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, how do you approach writing for comics and like the graphic novel comics medium versus like when you want to tell your story versus writing for like film or text? Like, why did you choose comics and sort of what draws you to writing for comics versus another medium to tell your story? You guys want to go go somewhere? down the line pretty uh, much. Okay, I just see does. comics in my head. Like, I've tried writing other stuff, and that's just how it is. You know, like my brain doesn't work the other ways. I've tried, but really for me, I don't I don't see things in sequence. I see the pages. You know, and that's what it is. So. Uh, I've tried writing other stuff, and it just doesn't, it's not, it's not a struggle, it's just not what I want to do. So that's why I just do comics, because I see the pages, you know? I love collaboration. I'm, I'm a twin. I grew up playing music in bands, and I love taking an idea and growing it with other people. And prose is so insular, and just you're by yourself. And mm -hmm. comics, more so than film, because film will go out to a whole lot of people. Comics is just our team at any given time. And I love, as a writer, you write something and put it to your artist, and especially with creator-owned work where you choose your artist and it's someone you trust and you probably love their work, it's the most fun thing in the world to get the pages back and come back to you and you're outside it again. And it just, again, it's an addicting process and it's the best, just the collaboration. And every change is always something new and something fun, so. I didn't know you were a twin. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking the same thing. I'm really fascinated by that for some reason. If only is that my... really boring? I'm sorry. No, no, I, I just wish my brother was like an artist or something cool. Yeah. <laughs> but he was a musician, so that was like, he, was, he would get the second introduction. Does, at, yeah. like... Does he ever just come do panels for you? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe okay, he is well, right now. <laughs> That's so awesome. I'll do signings for you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do all kinds of writing. Um, I, I, write, I write other stuff, too. Um, uh, this is, it's, it's just, the, you know, it's different sets of muscles. Um, you always want to be working on the other thing, by the way. Like you always like whatever it is that you, that is due next is the last thing in the world you want to work on. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I think uh, like I like vanilla and chocolate. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of with you on, on that. Like uh, I, a little bit of everything so far. I, I I've written other stuff. I've done a couple video game things, but. Just my whole life has been wanting to do comics, despite having interest in other, you know, the novels or movies or, or, or whatever. But yeah, I have a theater degree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> theater degrees. <laughs> Make some noise. Uh, but but I don't know, man. It it always comes back to just the the the, char the biggest charge I get is comics, and I think a lot of it is, you know, uh, when I when I when I you know, like like for instance, Sh Shutter is a perfect example. Because the original idea and what it ended beca becoming with Layla and Owen, you know, together was like something I never could have uh, um, imagined. Like, to plug someone else's book, uh, if someone's not read comics, wants to read comics, the number one book I recommend is called I Kill Giants. Uh, I don't know if you read best. it. The best. Joe Kelly and, and J.M. Kendamura. Because it's an, it's an embodiment of everything why I, I love this medium so much. It's something that these are two guys from completely opposite ends of the world uh, doing a comic that just wouldn't exist without them uh, and it's a, it, it's you know it's a it's a personal story but it's dressed in this huge uh, kind of fantasy backdrop that you couldn't really do you know in a movie and it's the thing is like right now how much does a movie cost to make like it gets decent distribution 60 mil yeah at least? every once in a while we get uh, some some kind of a, a 
Hollywood interest in Pretty Deadly or yeah. whatever, and they're like, like, good yeah. luck. <laughs> yeah. Do the math on that budget. Do the math on that budget. Yeah, you know, like that ain't gonna happen. Well, but there's no limit in yeah. in comic books. Like, you know, what what, what do you want to do? Can you draw yeah. it? Yeah. Sold. Yeah, that's you know? why that's why Layla's the perfect partner. It's just yeah. like she can she can draw anything. And there's 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 no one at Image telling us like oh you know you shouldn't again they're publishing a book called Bitch Planet they're not telling us what to do or not to do they're letting us do kind of whatever and that's yeah. what and the pitch process for that by the way was a uh, uh, title yeah, was, <laughs> no no like li literally it was it was uh, uh, Eric was like so what's next and I was like well you know what I have the, I have this thing that I want to do that's like a, a you know it's a, a kind of a feminist take on exploitation films and I, and, I, and I think I mean just a working title but uh, it's I was thinking of maybe calling it Bitch Planet and uh, uh, and I get this email back that was like I would very much like to publish something <laughs> true story that's uh, right yeah I mean for me I've, I've read comics since I was a kid that's pretty much all I ever wanted to do um, you know I've never written a screenplay maybe someday that would be cool uh, everybody dreams of those giant piles of money that they have in Hollywood. Um, but yeah, like they're saying, I mean, any of the books, you know, any of us are doing an image, you could take everybody involved with that book and put them, you know, fit them on this panel right here. And those are, those are the only people you have to deal with in order to, to bring this thing to life. You know, you talk to one or two people at image, then you have the couple of people who actually put the book together. And then, you know, it goes directly to you guys at a shop. That's awesome, as opposed to, you know, I know people who work in Hollywood and they spend their whole lives working and writing things and dealing with the, uh, hundreds of different people. The more money is involved, the more people who have a say in things, more fingers in the pie, and maybe they have something produced at some point. Um, this is a way better, way better way to tell stories, in my opinion, so I'm, I'm happy just doing this. And also, like, even though our book seems like it's a realistic thing like as far as my approach to it like it's it is comics like I'm not trying to make a TV on a TV show on paper right yeah. you know, and I think I'm, I'm very confident that when you read it it will feel like comics like a thing that you know maybe it would exist all right in another medium but you're, it's not gonna be the same experience yeah that would be a different thing yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we got about five minutes left so we have time for one more question I think oh, yeah. Oh, we can do two. Come yeah, on. Yeah, we can try to squeeze it in. Do it. Do it. So I'm really enjoying it. And um, one of the aspects that kind of caught my attention was that creepy little nursery rhyme type thing that you've got going through it. And um, I kind of wondered what gave you the idea to include that element. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I sort of liked the idea of there being a, a, a ballad for her. Um, uh, and it was supposed to be the first thing that I wrote. Um, and then like, uh, I wanted to start it with an invocation to the muse. Um, and so I, I was trying to invoke Calliope. And, uh, and then like, I got in a, an argument with my editor, who, who is an amazing person, even though I keep tell, talking about <laughs> it like she's not. Um, uh, but you know, it, it, there's a slightly antagonistic relationship that's set up there. Um, but, uh, so I got, and she was like, why Calliope? And I'm like, epic poetry. She's like, but this is not epic poetry. I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so anyway, I got, I got like weirdly stifled by that. And so um, I ended up, the, the, the song was the very last thing that was written. It was literally written and lettered the night before the book went to press. Um, and so because of that, there are a couple of lines in it that the meter is off. And I kept telling myself, I'm just going to fix it before the, I'm going to fix it before it goes to trade. I'm going to fix it before it goes to trade. And, and then once it was done, I, I never did. So it just stayed that way. But there is, a, there is a, another, the Shield Maids also have uh, a verse. And the Shield Maids verse that's in issue five, the meter's right on that. So I win. <laughs> <laughs> Quick question. Um, my son and my daughter are trying to write a comic book together, and I just thought maybe you guys could talk a little bit more. This is the first panel I've seen with artists and the writers together. Talk a little bit about your communication and relationships together building a comic book. They'll want to get a contract. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> That's awesome. There's nothing I would enjoy it more. I, when I was in bands, I was with my brother, and working with family is... So rewarding and so great. And honestly, just be true to what they want to do. And comics is a testament that the audience is there. And there are events like this. And 
there's community, and I got into comics just by coming to shows and bringing my work and setting up. And the number one thing I say is just do it. Yeah. yeah. And that's how everyone here got here. You just got to make what you love. And yeah, every working relationship is different. Like every single artist writer pairing is different. And um, like Emma and I have an agreement that I have the last word on words, and she has the last word on pictures. So if there's anything that we ever disagree about. Uh, it, then we just defer to that process, and that helps a lot. And we very seldom actually disagree, which is kind of amazing, and I'm sort of like not sure how that happened. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, my son I, is only six, but he draws compulsively, and um, and yeah, I, I just keep like being like, oh, I can't wait, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> I might realize my dream of how, you know. <laughs> No, drop! <laughs> <laughs> no football team. You're going to draw a new yeah. bug. <laughs> uh, all right, I think that's a good note to end on, honestly. You have me whipping my kid. All right! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you! Uh, Thank you guys for coming out. Thanks for asking questions. Uh, visit these people at their tables. They're great. You've seen how funny they are. So you're going to have a good yeah. time if you have a conversation. Um, the two people who asked me the nail biter question was you and you. I have ghosted traits for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous comics prizes. makes people happy. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a quick question? <laughs> 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 <laughs>